Greetings Floss fans, how's it going and welcome to Behind the Scenes with Ollie. You guys have been sending me some really nice fan mail and messages, so I thought it might be nice to go through those, because I, I really don't want to leave those just to fester in my internet inbox without acknowledging them. I, I, I want to show you guys that I appreciate your support, so I thought it might be nice if we had a cheeky cup of Earl Grey tea and went through all the fan mail that you guys have been sending in. Louis Nogueira wrote to me from Brazil saying, Dear Ollie, congratulations on 1,000 subscribers. I've been watching since you had the old digital camera and I'm writing to say that I loved every minute of it. Please don't stop making these videos. They're not only very entertaining, but also very educational. Thank you very much, Louis. That's really kind of you to, to write to me and say that. I'm really glad that you're enjoying the show. Thank you. Philip Sauter says that they're considering studying philosophy at university, but they're not really sure whether or not to go through with it because they're scared they won't turn out to be a famous intellectual and then they won't be able to get a job and they'll end up wasting their life. And they also want to know, does studying philosophy go well with any other subjects? I would say for a start, you don't need to worry about being the next Wittgenstein or Aristotle or, or Bertrand Russell and coming up with a brand new original intellectual theory on day one of your undergraduate degree. You know, as you as you immerse yourself in the techniques and the ways of thinking and, and how you actually do philosophy at a university, you will come up with some original criticisms of, of some of the things you'll be reading, but you don't need to come up with a brand new theory right from the get-go. I mean, you, you learn the method and it's really only if you go on to become a professional philosopher that you that you not need to start you know writing some original stuff and and not everybody who studies philosophy will go on to become a philosopher you know you can do other things with it that's one of the good things about it once you've got a a trained mind and you can think in that analytic way then employers see that and they think oh you know he's he's a guy or a girl who's who's obviously really clever because they've done a degree in philosophy but you don't have to go into teaching philosophy with that you could go into marketing or, or sales or anything else anything you want to really it, it's just it's a way of training your mind and that's a good thing to have you might have heard some people tell you that philosophy is a skive degree like it's an easy degree I'll tell you right now, that's not true. There's no such thing in my experience as an easy degree. Some degrees are easier than others. Medicine and chemistry, for instance, in the UK are, are thought to be really, really difficult. So some are probably easier than others. But doing a degree in anything is hard. You know, you, you're becoming a semi-expert in that field and, and that's a challenging thing and it takes a lot of brain power. So if anybody tells you that philosophy is easy and you should do it like that, don't believe it. That is not not true. The reason I got into it was because I was at school and I didn't really know what I wanted to do the rest of my life but I knew that I really enjoyed studying philosophy and not to blow my own trumpet you know I was getting good marks in it I was doing okay uh, and I also had a really really inspiring teacher at A level that's the um, that's the final year of, of English school anyway is uh, it's called A level I, I had a really amazing like one of those life-changing teachers who, who really makes you think about what you want to do and, and he, he really inspired me to go on and, and study philosophy more because I was enjoying learning it. And if you enjoy learning about it and it's what you really want to study, then I mean, you should go for it, man. And, and if you're not really very sure, then then talk to some other people who are doing a philosophy degree, you know, like me. You can always send messages to me or some of your mates who are doing philosophy degrees. Um, and then think about the other things you might want to do and talk to people and, and teachers who teach that as well and, and you know compare stories and see what you, what you like. You mentioned that you're in Switzerland and in Switzerland doing a humanities degree can often be looked down on. I, I don't know, I don't really know how it is in Switzerland. You'll have to you know come up to come and make your own decision off the back of that. But you know you shouldn't really let other people or, or concerns about the future dictate what you want to study. I mean if you want to study something because you're interested in it, then that's enough of a reason to do it. I mean, obviously you need to give a little bit of thought about your future and, and what's gonna get you a job and, and let you live in the lifestyle that you wanna live, but if you start thinking about what's gonna look good on my resume all the time, then you're never gonna really have any fun with it. And you wanna study something and, and become an expert in it if it really intrigues you and you really like hearing about it. So if you wanna study philosophy, I'd say go for it, man. It's a really rewarding experience, and, and if it's going to make you happy, then you should do what makes you happy. David SF messaged me on Twitter and said, I love your philosophical videos. Thanks a lot. I'm really enjoying them, and I'm really looking forward to the next videos. Thank you, David, for sending me that. That's, that's 
really kind just to just a little say hello. Thank you for that. That's really, really nice. I don't know what I'm doing with my life says, I love this channel. It deserves a lot more subscribers. And Hijackajapak7 says, keep up with your videos. They're really good. Thank you very much to both of you. I know you, Hijackajapak7, have said in the comments before that you like the little jokes that come in the videos as well. I'm glad somebody takes notice of the, the effort I go to to make the uh, videos entertaining as well as educational. So, so you're very welcome, both of you. Thank you for writing in. That's really kind of you. All these really nice things that you guys are sending in and saying about me, it's really, it's very flattering of you. I, I didn't want to just slip, leave them in my inbox, you know, I wanted to, to go through and acknowledge them and, and say thank you to you all. Sam Burns says, I really appreciate how altruistic you're being sharing all this learning with the world for free. Well, you know, it's, I don't think it's just me standing on high lecturing you guys. I think we're learning about these things together, you know, it, it's, a, it's a combined effort, it's, it's all of us learning about these topics and, and educating ourselves. I mean, and, and doing this channel with you guys really, really helps me with my studies, to be honest. I was um, had an exam today, actually, and, and um, one of the questions was asking me about the stuff that I was talking about in the Doctor Who philosophy episode, and I was able to bring that in in, in like really interesting examples and say, uh, and, and talk about the philosophy of, of Doctor Who. And one of the questions, <laughs> you could tell YouTube's on my mind, like one of the questions asked me for an example of a necessary a posteriori statement. And I, I kind of had a bit of a blank and ended up writing as my example, Felix Chelberg is PewDiePie, and then writing an essay defending how that statement was both a posteriori and also a necessary truth. <laughs> I don't know, some examiner somewhere is going to be like, I have no idea what this is talking about. Oh, very good. Hey, start. Hey, start. Jonathan EF says, It's really hard to find great philosophy stuff on YouTube, and your channel is one of my favourites. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan EF. That's really kind. He also says, Can you recommend any other resources on the internet for learning about philosophy? Well, there are a few other philosophy channels dedicated to, uh, a few other YouTube channels dedicated to philosophy. Also online, you'll find the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy and the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. They are quite technical, maybe a little bit dry. I don't know what stage of your philosophical learning you're at. Uh, they are like encyclopedias, but they are written and maintained by actual professional philosophers. So it's a lot more reliable than just going on Wikipedia and reading about a philosophical problem because they actually give step-by-step -step breakdowns of arguments and, and kind of really try and make it explicitly clear. But those are a little bit dry, so maybe that's not your cup of tea. Some of the original philosophical texts, the classics, are, are all online because after the copyright to something expires, they can all be put online for free. So you'll find a lot of Kant online, a lot of Hume online, and the ancients as well, Aristotle and Plato, you'll find those too. So if you wanted to actually learn more about philosophy on the internet, you could just read some philosophy. I know that um, you maybe don't have a lot of time, but Plato's dialogues are usually pretty short, like the Euthyphro dialogue, which we did a, uh, an episode on, on way back. You could read that in, in you know half an hour, it's, it's really easy. I'd recommend starting with Plato, actually, because his style is very easy and kind of informal and, and pretty cool to understand, and it, it's kind of gentle questioning and invites you to do some of the thinking yourself. Then maybe when you've kind of got a bit more comfortable with it, you could try some Hume. Hume's fairly easy as philosophers go. It might take you a couple of pages just to just to get into it, just to get the feel for the kind of language he uses. But yeah, Hume would be a good place to start. Some of his shorter essays, not his, his longer books. But yeah, I mean, if you if you wanted to learn about philosophy on the internet, as, as well as watching Philosopher Tube, obviously, and, and being a dedicated philosopher fan, you could actually just read some philosophy. Maximilian Svensson says, keep up the good work. You too, Maximilian Svensson. That is an awesome, awesome name. <laughs> Jim Groth says, it's been really fun to see you go from brand new to this. I am super happy for you. Well, thank you very much, Jim Groth. That's really kind. I know that you have actually been here since the beginning. In fact, I just checked the YouTube subscriber list for Philosophy Tube. Jim Groth, you were the first subscriber to Philosophy Tube. So now that we've passed a thousand, I think you deserve a little prize for that, for being the first person to formally believe in Philosophy Tube. So, Jim Groth, if you send me your address in a little inbox message, I will send you a small token of my appreciation. I will send you a prize to say thank you for being the first of 
a wonderful, wonderful group of subscribers who are growing all the time. Just so this episode of Behind the Scenes of Lolly isn't just me stroking my ego and saying thank you to all you guys for all the nice things you've been saying, there is an actual practical ethical discussion that we could talk about, because Mad Hatter himself has sent me an article from Denmark asking, should we lie to kids about Santa Claus? It's kind of a seasonal topical thing with Christmas going up. Is it okay for us to tell kids that there's a Santa Claus when really there isn't? I'm not really sure what to think about this. I would say that, I mean, children understand the difference between fact and fiction. People say that if you if you tell them lies about Santa Claus, it, it might confuse them about what's imaginary and what's real. I don't think so. Children know what's imaginary and what's real. I mean, if you read them a story at bedtime, they know it's not true. So, so if they them finding out that Santa's not real isn't gonna make them go, oh my god, you know, what if I'm living in the Matrix and what if it's all a lie? What else have you not told me? I don't, I don't think. Or, you know, I don't certainly, I don't remember doing that. I, I don't think that's going to really be that much of a problem. You might say that it's just not okay to lie to your kids, no matter what the circumstances. I mean, Immanuel Kant certainly thought that it was never, ever, ever okay to lie to anyone under any circumstances. Maybe nowadays we'd probably think, well, it probably depends on the consequences of the lie. If you're, if you lying to your child about the existence of Santa Claus is gonna make them really excited and make them really happy and, and make you happy as well when you see how happy they are and kind of really make a nice traditional Christmassy feeling in the in the in the depths of your heart then maybe setting that line might be might even be a good thing if it brings about good consequences some people might say it teaches children to be nice just for the sake of getting presents and, and not for moral reasons it, it's like bribing them to be good and that's not okay well, I guess whether or not you think that's okay probably depends on what sort of view you have of morality. I mean, Aristotle would certainly say that it's okay to make children be good by habit when they're kids, you know, to teach them, you know, be good and you'll get presents and don't be bad or you'll be punished, so that they acquire the habits of virtue, so that they acquire the character traits of being a good person and, and continue to practice them. Uh, because, you know, kids probably don't understand many of the moral reasons behind why people act the way they do. It's difficult to make children understand the complex facets of morality. So maybe it's okay to tell children, be good and you'll get presents, so that they get into the habit of being good. And then when they grow up, they're like, oh, well, when I was a kid, I was only good because I didn't want to be punished and because I wanted Santa to, Santa to reward me. But now I understand, and now now that I've I've acquired the habits of virtue, it's easier for me to, good, to be a good person because of that. So I, I reckon your outlook on that question probably going to depend on how you view morality and a great deal on how you view child psychology as well. I mean, I, are there any parents out there who want to weigh in on this discussion? I'm, I'm keen to defer to parents on this issue because I don't have any kids myself and I wasn't particularly planning on it, so I don't think that this is going to be an issue that I really have to deal with. But if you're out there and you've got, if you're a philosopher fan with kids and, and you're, you're gearing up for Christmas, are you going to be telling them about Santa? Why? Why not? I mean, I, I think statistically a lot of people do, but but are you? And, and what are your reasons for doing that? And, and did you think at any point that it might not be okay to lie to them? Let me know what you think. I'm interested to hear what parents out there think. Well, thank you Mad Hatter himself for sending in that discussion all the way from Denmark. And since you are in Denmark, I will say Hi Oktag Betrag Tende. Those are all the messages that I've got time to go through this time on Behind the Scenes of Dolly. Thank you very much for sending those in and all your all your really, really kind words. I do read everything you guys send in. Uh, I read all the comments. I read all the, the tweets and the Facebook messages, the whole thing. I read all the ones that, that Google Plus marks as spam. And I even read the ones that Google Plus correctly marks as spam because they make me laugh. <laughs> You guys have sent me all this stuff over Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube and on the internet and stuff, but if you wanted to, I could set up another way for us to communicate. I mean, I'm keen to keep as many channels open between us as possible, to have as many avenues for communication between us all as I can. So if you wanted, I could set up a P.O. box and you guys could send me stuff that way through, through snail mail if you wanted to. I mean, I could either get one on a permanent basis if you thought it was a really good idea or, or maybe um, I could get one for a couple of months. So I want to make sure that if there's any way you guys want to get in contact with me that you can. So so let me know what you think about that. Do, should we get a PO box? Is the, is the stuff you want to send me or are you happy with the internet as it is? I mean we don't we don't have to make a final decision now. We can always reassess later on but what, what do you think? Is communicating over the internet fine or should we get a PO box or what? I mean I'm, I'm keen to have your suggestions whatever they may be. 
That's all the stuff we've got time to go through on this episode of Behind the Scenes with Ollie. Thank you very much to everyone who sent in fan mail and messages on, on Twitter and Facebook and everything. That's really, really kind of you to do that. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm really glad that you enjoyed the show. Thank you all very much for watching. I will see you in the next episode. And in the meantime, keep being cool, keep being awesome, keep being really clever. Bye!